All right. Good evening, my good brethren, and uh, a happy Sunday evening to you. It is my honor and joy to be able to substitute for our good brother Shane while he is still recovering from the coronavirus. And I'm not going to uh, conduct a full sermon or lesson, but I am going to just spend a few minutes with you in regards to a devotion. Um, and it's a devotion that uh, comes from Paul Earnhardt's book. It's a book on the uh, called The Spiritual Revolution, and it's a study on the Sermon on the Mount. I don't know if you can read that, but if you have never gotten uh, this book and done devotions, I would strongly encourage you to get Paul Earnhardt's Spiritual Revolution and spend time reading his thoughts on the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. It is an outstanding uh, work, and he has done a wonderful job, and it makes it a great Bible devotion that you can do in your home with your children, and I would strongly encourage everyone to be able to do it. We've actually been to it through it twice with the Haley boys, and Stephanie and I are on our third time through it, and every time we read it, uh, we have new insights and new thoughts. It's just the Sermon on the Mount is one of those sermons that you could read it a thousand times and a thousand times you'll pick out new things that the Lord has uh, communicated to us to help us truly be the kind of disciples, kingdom citizens that he wants us to be. The specific beatitude that I would like to uh, uh, focus on this morning is the fourth beatitude out of uh, the ones that uh, Jesus has. And it starts in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, where he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, I want to make some just observations which should be uh, pretty common to us. We The, the, the term that uh, Matthew uses or that Jesus actually uses to describe the hunger and the thirst, the longing for food, is the same term that's used back in uh, the earlier chapter when Jesus is coming out of the wilderness. And in uh, Matthew 4, uh, Matthew writes that Jesus had fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights, and he was hungry. I don't know of anybody that's ever fasted for that length of time. I know there are some good brethren that uh, believe that fasting is good. I've actually never done it myself, but I certainly have never done it for 40 days. And I don't know anybody who has fasted for that length of time. But the idea that Jesus is conveying here in Matthew 5 in the Beatitudes is the deprivation of food and water, the impact that that has on the body. And since we are really, that's a foreign idea to us, I thought I would just go back into history and take a few images that you might recognize for those of you who remember your history. The, the uh, Jews in Dachau and Auschwitz genuinely and truly hungered and thirsted. And you can see the deprivation of food and water, the impact that that has on the human body. Those images are stark, and I hope you're not squeamish, and I hope this doesn't... Uh, upset you, but I think it really helps create a real good image in our minds about what Jesus is talking about our spirit is like when we ha are deprived from righteousness, righteousness, rightness with God, oneness with God. That's the image that we need to have of what our spirit looks like when we deprive it from oneness with God. 
when we deprive it from that which it naturally has been designed to long for and to be satiated and to be to be fulfilled through being um, fed and nourished with the righteousness that can only come from being in a good relationship with our creator. So I want you to consider it as if Jesus is talking about blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness because they have a longing for nourishment as if their life depends on it. And indeed, our spiritual life does depend on it. Our spiritual life needs to be considered as if it depends on rightness and oneness with our God. Now, there's not a direct parallel between the images that I showed you of what it looks like um, to be deprived of physical food and physical water and what spiritual deprivement looks like. There is a fundamental difference between stomach hungry and malnourished physically, uh, and heart uh, hungry, which is the deprivation of your spiritual nourishment. And sometimes it's very difficult to recognize when we are not spiritually nourished. But we need to consider our spirits in the same visual image as those in Auschwitz and Dachau when we consider what we are, what we look like without being properly nourished spiritually from our father. You know, the prodigal son gives us a good image as well. You remember the prodigal son goes out and he fills his body with uh, riotous carnal living. And then when his money runs out, he is willing to eat pig slop. He's so hungry. He's so deprived from what he needs to live and thrive that he is willing to subject himself to feeding on the very slop that he serves to four-legged, filthy pigs. That image should resonate with us as well. I would like to actually read to you a segment of what Brother Paul Earnhardt has written in his book. He says uh, on page 19, there is in every human being a built-in and inescapable need for God. This God hunger is movingly expressed by David while he is a fugitive from Saul. Saul, I mean, uh, David writes, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Psalm 63, 1. Think of that imagery that David gives. He is a man without a people. He's been fleeing for his life for a long period of time. He has no um, ability to go back to Jerusalem and to worship God as he has commanded his people, his fellowship and his spiritual nourishment. And even at times, as we know, his physical nourishment is um, completely without uh, being sustained. And here he writes this in such a beautiful way. Sin has put in every man a God-shaped emptiness. And I will continue reading from Brother Earnhardt. Characteristically, we try to ease this void by pouring in all kinds of unbelievable trash. <clears throat> but we may as well try to pour Niagara Falls into a teacup as to satisfy our god -akin spirits with mere, quote, things and carnal thrills. Unable to meet our fundamental need, money and pleasure, and even worldly wisdom become the basis for an insatiable appetite that leaves us empty, unfilled, and burnt out. 
think of the words that um, Solomon, the preacher, writes in Ecclesiastes 5. Actually, let's just flip over there in Ecclesiastes 5, verses 10 and 11. Listen to what he says about this. He who loves his money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This, too, is pure vanity. When good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to their owners except to look on? The physical desire and search for mere carnal pleasure to fulfill that which we naturally long for that can only be filled through our spiritual oneness with God, through the nourishment that comes to our souls and to our hearts, that being fed through the the gospel of Christ that connects us with our Father. It's the only thing that can fulfill that nourishment. I continue on with Brother Earnhardt. We will never have enough, feel enough, or know enough to find contentment without God. What we need is righteousness, and as Jesus says, those that long for it are destined to know a transcendent satisfaction and peace. The peace that they will find is that they will be filled, and filled with a nourishment that will not ever be devoid of hunger again. It'll never be devoid of being fed with the, the, the uh, well of water that does not uh, uh, empty or relinquish the satisfaction that comes from being nourished properly. And we'll conclude by going back to a, a, a passage and a story that we're all very familiar with, which is Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. She is there drawing water which is done every day because the bodies, the carnal flesh needs it to survive. And Jesus is trying to communicate to her who he is and what he came to offer and how what he has to offer um, fulfills this longing eternally. And when one obtains it, there is no longer this needing to go back and draw and go back and draw day after day. It's eternal in its nature. And she questions him and she says, well, this well, speaking of the well she was drawing at, was dug by Jacob, our forefather. Surely you do not have a well better than this one. And Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again. Speaking of Jacob's well, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. That is the kind of water that we need to sustain our souls, to sustain our spirit, to sustain the life and connection that we have with our creator through Jesus Christ. So let us remember the images of Dachau, in Auschwitz, let us remember that our spirits look like the flesh when it has no food and when it has no water. And let us strengthen it and let us fill it with that which comes from our Lord. May that be something that we think about this week. My hope and prayer is that we will each be encouraged and strengthened in this time of the pandemic when it is easy to, to, to lack spiritual nourishment because we are not with each other like we would normally be. Strengthen each other, pray for each other, check on each other, and may we stay deep into the word of God, which brings the life-giving message and the connection that we have through the blood of Jesus, which of course forgives us of our sins. My good brethren, I hope you have a wonderful week. May God bless each and every one of you. We'll be thinking about you and praying for you. Good night.